There's one thing I want you to walk out of here knowing today. Above everything else you could ever know, I hope that you will know this and embrace it and believe it. And that's that God loves you so much. God loves you so much. There may be even a part of you hearing that and you're like numb to that, maybe to some extent. Like maybe you've heard people tell you that. Maybe you've heard that said before and you're like, oh, well, okay, yeah, that's not too profound. But I would ask, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that God loves you? That he made you? That he loves you better than you could ever love yourself? And he knows what's best for you? And that he's at work trying to bring you into what is best for you? Sometimes it really takes a lot of faith to believe that, depending on how you're feeling, depending on your circumstances. But it is my hope and prayer that that's what you know more than anything else. And we, we began a series a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and so if you're here for the first time ever or for the first time in a long time, the, the series is called Healthy You uh, because we want you to experience becoming all that God wants you to become. But I will pause and say today we're actually going to be talking about sex and sexuality. And so you're probably sitting there saying, man, I, I just came to watch a baptism. Who's that? What's going on here? Like, hello? Um, the, the last time that I preached on this topic, I got to tell you this story because it actually strikes a, a, a solemn chord in my heart. But one of my good friends who's been a member here at Hickory Grove for a very long time uh, told me after preaching a sermon on sex and sexuality, uh, she was very encouraging and appreciative, but she told me, I have a friend who attends Hickory Grove that purposefully abstained from coming, knowing ahead of time. We always try to tell people ahead of time. We sent out posts and emails about it this week so that, you know, you could use parental guidance and all that good stuff. Uh, and so we, they say, well, they abstain, but not because they're a parent, not because of any of that. And I'm like, oh, okay. She was, But uh, later on, she said, but here's the thing. After the service, later on that week, she saw her friend, and that friend said, so... Are we allowed to love everybody or not? That was the question. That was the fear that caused her to not come because she was so afraid as much as she loves God and loves this church and loves the teaching. Am I allowed to love everybody or not? And, I, and it almost broke my heart to hear that question because I think what gets lost in the teaching, sometimes the difficult teachings about how we are to live our lives, God's plan for our lives, is that do you, do you not know that everything God tells us to do is out of the love of the Father who made you, that his way is the best way? You know, if, if any of you dads out there have adult children, you felt this tension <laughs> Because you're like, now I just have to let them choose what they're going to choose. I can't control, I can't, you know, so you're just, but I know what's best and I can see some things over here that aren't the best, but I want them to choose what's best, but I can't make them choose what's best. You've got just a tiny nano cosm <laughs> of what God feels, I believe. I think he feels that so much because he loves us so, so much. So I want you to hear, God loves you. He loves everyone. He created you. He created every one of us. He knows you and loves you better than you could ever know and love yourself. And I believe he wants to put you on a journey to become. What God cares most about is what you are becoming, your character, who you are. He spends way more effort on the people that we read about in this book called the Bible, he spends way more effort getting them to become than having them to act a certain way. Uh, if you become uh, someone who is a person after God's own heart, who is surrendered to him, who is seeking him, the actions are going to follow. And that's something that we're learning throughout this series. So I want to give you a verse that we've read each week in this series so far. Luke 10, 27 says, And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. In that one verse, we see this is what it means to be healthy. It means to love God with all of ourselves, heart, 
soul, mind, and body. And then we read this uh, passage a couple of times already, Romans 12, 1 and 2, and you essentially just sang this verse. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we actually, in the past couple of weeks, have already talked about your thought life. We've talked about how your body matters to God and how we could think about worshiping God with your body. That was last week. But we even said last week, we're leaving the pink elephant in the room for the next week, and that pink elephant is about sexuality. And so just to set the the background, we're going to look at a passage in 1 Corinthians 6. We looked at two verses from this passage last week. We took them out of context, to be honest with you, and left out the verses that come before it. We're going to look at those verses now. But just to recap, something that uh, it sounds very academic, but hang with me for just a moment. There was a philosophy that existed in the first century called Gnostic dualism. And that's where the belief was the body and all of matter, physical matter, is evil It holds us back. The spirit is what is good. And so what that ended up causing people to think about, especially even new believers in Jesus, is it really doesn't matter what I do with my body. I can do whatever I want. Body's evil. Body doesn't matter. Matter doesn't matter to God. It's about my spirit. As long as I've uh, asked him to save my spirit and I'm living out spiritually for him, I can do whatever I want with my body. Well, that had creeped into the church, and so literally new believers, whether they were former Jewish believers or Greek believers, and this was especially true of Greek believers because they most likely came out of uh, a pantheon of gods and goddesses that they worshipped, some of which in acts of worship involved sexual promiscuity. So they were used to it being okay to worship a, a false god or god, a goddess in ways that involve sexuality. Then they get introduced to Jesus and hear about his salvation, his death, burial, and resurrection, and how he is the way, the truth, and the life, and they embrace that and believe that, but they're still taking in all those years of, of culture that they were raised in. They said, well, we can do whatever we want with our bodies, right? So Paul confronts this and teaches on this as he writes a letter to the Corinthian church. Because in the city of Corinth, where it was a very uh, melting, big melting pot of cultural diversity, this Gnostic dualism, it creeped into the very church. So here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 6, starting at verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. And let me just pause here before I move on. He's quoting the people That was like a mantra for them. Like, hey, I've placed my faith in Jesus. He died on the cross for my sins. All my sins are forgiven. Therefore, I'm free. And I can do whatever I want. And if you're a Jewish believer, that means I don't have to worry about the weight of obeying all the law of Moses, which takes up a big chunk of the Old Testament. Like, I don't have to worry about all those laws and commands anymore. I can do whatever I want. I am free. And then the Hellenistic believers are like, yeah, I mean, we never had the Mosaic Law, so yeah, we're with you. We're with you there. And Paul says, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying use your wisdom. Yeah, you, you could do whatever you want, but not everything you do is helpful. You could do whatever you want, but not everything is good for you because it could master you. It could dominate you. And then he quotes another thing that they often said. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. In other words, who cares? Eat whatever you want. Do whatever you want with your body. It doesn't matter. But he goes on to say, but God, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power, making a reference to the resurrection. And he goes on to say, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, 
but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know, we read these two verses last week, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. I want to reread verse 13. And I'm going to use a different English translation called the New Living Translation. It gives a little bit more of a modern take on it and more modern words and syntax. And here's what it says. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true, though someday God will do away with both of them. But you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord and the Lord cares about our bodies. I love that. Why is any of this written? Because God cares. The Father cares. He knows what is best. He is the manufacturer of our bodies and our lives. And He has a plan and a purpose. And so when He sees that we're going astray, going away from what is best, He's going to talk to us about that and say, no, no, no. Do it my way. Do things my way. And I promise you will be free. And I think that's the message of this. So in these nine verses we just read, there are four things that I believe the Heavenly Father wants you to know about sex and sexuality. First, your body was given to you by God for Him. For Him. I don't think this way. I'll be honest with you. I don't think, wow, God gave me this body for Him. (laughs) That He wants something to happen in this body for His glory that he wants this body he gave me. Man, that changes everything when you think about it, right? Uh, Some of you look and you just hate on your body. I just hate that. No, no, no. God gave you that body. Stop hating it. Stop hating on it. And embrace the body that God has given you, but ask him to help you to, okay, God, how can I become the healthiest version of myself? How can you be glorified in this body that you've given me? Your body was given to you by God for him. And then secondly, if you are a believer... What you do with your body, this passage clearly states, you are also doing it with the body of Christ. If you've placed your faith in Jesus, he goes on and talks about this six chapters later when he talks about the spiritual gifts that we are given when we become a believer. He gives us the ability to do something that helps further his mission on earth. And he says, you are a member of the body of Christ. Well, it gives me the warm fuzzies when I read it in in chapter 12, but when you see it here, you're like, ooh, that stings a little bit. Whatever I do with my body, I'm doing it with the very body of Christ. Man, that's challenging, isn't it? Convicting. Thirdly, sex is a one flesh union created by God for the purpose of joining one man and one woman together for a life of sacrificial love for one another. I mean, I I can't think of a better way to write that in one sentence, how to define biblical sexuality, how to define God's teaching on what sex is. It's this. And he he sums it up in really one phrase, quoting from Genesis 2, where he gives the story of his creation, where he says, the two will become one flesh. When he says that right there in verse 16, That is him saying, remember that when I manufactured this, that when I created this, I created it to be enjoyed and to be used by God between one man, one woman, in a committed relationship for life. That's his teaching. Then fourthly and lastly, when you do sex any other way but God's way, you're harming your own self. And he says that. All other sins are, are outside the body, but this one you're actually sinning against your own body. It's what Scripture says about this. So, each and every week in this series, our goal is to give you a tweak, a health tweak, something simple. You know, week one we were talking about the minds, and we said, do a bean check on your mind. Like, look at the thoughts that are coming into your brains and check and make sure that they are of God and that they're good for you. And if not, kick the bad ones out, keep the good ones coming. Last week we talked about, hey, just pick one thing to do to honor God with your body. Do it for three weeks and see if you can form a new habit that's good for you. So here is the health tweak for today. And I believe it is so simple, yet probably very difficult. (laughs) And it's this. Decide once and for all that you will let the Bible be your sole authority on matters of sexuality. 
that you're just saying, I know there's a lot out there about this topic all over the world. I can find all kinds of information out there. Let's, let's reverse that. Actually, I don't have to go find it. It's everywhere. It's coming at me from all different directions all the time. There's all kinds of messaging and, dare I say, teaching about this. But what if you were saying, you know what? I'm going to go to the manufacturer, the origin, the one who created me, the one who created this thing we call sex, and say, he's the authority, and I will only trust that above everything else. That's it. That's the tweak. In some ways, that's easier than, you know, someone told me after last week's message, they decided to get on a stationary bike three times a week. I'm like, man, that's awesome. Uh, very cool. That's going to take some effort. You know, it's going to take a new habit, you know. And that's not always easy to do something like that. In some ways, this seems easier, but it's a huge submission, isn't it? You're saying, okay, I'm going to only trust what he says above all the other messaging. It takes submission and surrender to do that. And some might say, I don't know, I feel like, I feel like this is judgmental and maybe even condemning. I, I'm getting that feeling and that vibe. Let me tell you this. Probably the most famous verse in all the Bible is John 3, 16. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son so that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. In the very next verse, he says, and the Son did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. And so this isn't condemnation. This is love. And he wants to set us free from the things that hold us back in this world, but the other side of that coin is sometimes you have to say hard things about the things that are holding us back. In other words, hey, I, He's not just offering us forgiveness for where we've gone wrong. He wants to keep us away from the things that will keep us in the wrong areas of our life. And so when we read these passages, the question is, am I, am I going to trust the God who wrote this book and reveals in this book that he put on human flesh and died on a cross for me so that by his grace I might be saved and redeemed forever? The same God who wrote this also gives us some teachings that might be very difficult in the year 2022 in this world in which we live but do we embrace it knowing that it comes from a loving God who made us? That's the question. I believe there's going to be some natural consequences if we really embrace this. If we really say, I'm going to embrace this tweak, I'm going to do the tweak, and I'm going to let the Bible be the sole authority on matters of sex and sexuality, then I believe this is what you'll end up doing. First, you will recognize lust in your heart and you will fight against it. Honestly, we're, we're, we'll talk about this in just a little bit. We think about the hot button, debatable topics in our world right now. The Bible spends a lot more time talking about this. And there's no debate on this. This is a real thing. All, every one of us kind of stand in, con, under conviction when I read that passage, especially all of us men. There's, this is a battle all of us men especially face. And see Jesus, the same Jesus who says, for God so of the world... And I, I came not to, to get, not to condemn, but to save and to rescue. And I love you so much. That same Jesus said this in Matthew 5, 28. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Whew. Man, that stings. Doesn't it, guys? Jesus taught that if you lust, it's the same as adultery. So we must battle against it. A second thing that I think is a natural consequence of embracing this health tweak is that you would pursue your husband or wife as the sole source of sexual fulfillment in your life. Because in the totality of the teaching of Scripture, it's the only God-ordained, God-encouraged source of sexual fulfillment. Nothing else, no one else, just your spouse. It's kind of a big deal. We're going to circle back to that in just a moment. The next one that I think is a natural consequence and result of allowing the Bible to be your sole source of authority is that you would choose a biblical path even if you have same-sex attraction. In both the Old and the New Testament, over and over again, the totality of, of Scripture teaches that very clearly that we are not to engage in sexual activity with the same gender or any other entity, but in fact, the opposite gender, but not just in any way, only in that committed, 
for life marriage relationship. That's it. That's the only way, according to scriptures. Now, the verses I'm about to read to you, again, I've already said it, they may come off a little confrontational. But I want you to hear the heart of a father. You remember how I mentioned that if you're a dad and you have adult children, that there comes a point where you're like, I see them going this way, and I'm trying to get them to go this way, but they're refusing to go this way, and I can't control them and make them to stop going this way and go this way. I feel like the father is expressing that in the passage I'm about to read. In Romans 1, starting at verse 22, it says, Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And I believe that this is the biggest problem we have in this topic is that at the end of the day we idolize creation over the creator and it causes us to go sideways it causes us to go off the path of God's best for us and it says in verse 26 for this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. It's almost like Paul's trying to explain why is this happening? Even sometimes among believers, why is this happening? And it's this, like God is trying to say, this is the way sexuality was meant to be. This is what I created it for. But you keep going down that path, down that path, down that path, and I'm trying, and now you just can't even hear my voice anymore because you're so set on experiencing what you want that I have to just let it go and hope that you one day embrace the truth. This is, this is the heart of a father and a creator in this passage. God loves you so much. He cares too much to not say, here's the truth about sex and sexuality. Here's how I made it. Here's the purpose for which I made it. And if it's done any other way, you will not experience my best for you. That's the message of a loving father. I will say one more thing. Choosing a biblical path is also a natural consequence of embracing this health week. Choosing a biblical path, even if you've experienced gender fluidity, And it's something I'm still learning a lot about, talking with people who have experienced it even. And again, I don't stand up here saying, hey, I I understand all that, and I'm about to drop the mic on you and say, this is not right, this is not right. Man, I, I don't know what it's like to experience that. Maybe you have experienced this personally. or Maybe someone you love and care about has. Or maybe you haven't, but you think, you know, this should be embraced and celebrated in my mind. Or maybe you haven't experienced it, But you're like, I think it's chaotic and terrible. Wherever you are in your feelings about that, I really can only give one verse. And to me, I'm just a simple-minded guy. And you got to talk to me like I'm a three-year-old sometimes so I can get it and understand it. I go back to Genesis chapter 1, the very first chapter in the Bible, and this is how it describes God's creation of humanity. Genesis 1.27, So God created man in his own image, In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. I don't say that to just drop the mic and say, take that. I really don't. It's just the truth. It's just what the Bible says. The same Bible that we look to to understand salvation and grace also tells us that. And you know what? I believe you uh, you can extrapolate from that one simple verse. Anything other than male and female... We created, not him. Anything other than male and female, we, we create, not him. And I think that we just need to be challenged by that and think that through. You know, another thing that Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 14, is that he is not a God of disorder and chaos, but a God of peace. And I believe our current world is not experiencing peace when it comes to sexual health. And I'm hoping that somehow, some way, there'll be people who will look to a different source to say, maybe this is right. Maybe this is the right way to think about this. 
I want to circle back to the first two things, though. Battling lust in your life. Making sure your spouse is a sole source of sexual fulfillment. I've told my story before, um, uh, how I came to, you know, faith in Jesus Christ at the age of 15. When that happened, I had already been embroiled in a, an addiction to pornography. And the moment I prayed as best I knew how to ask Jesus to forgive me and save me and uh, uh, come into my life, which changed my life, no one had to tell me, you got to stop that pornography addiction. It immediately became the front lines battle in my life. And so at some point, um, I don't know how long after I became a Christian, a book came out called Every Man's Battle, written by Stephen Arterburn. And it was a book being recommended for all men to read because all men, to some extent, really battled this issue of lust. Uh, and so I'll be honest with you, I'm like, oh, I've heard it's a great book. I've even recommended it to guys. But I did not want to read it. Because at that point in my life, I felt like I'd overcome the battle so much, I was afraid it would give me PTSD, to be honest with you. Like, I don't want to, it's almost like I'm away from that. It's not a part of my life anymore. I didn't even want to read about it. But since I was recommending it, I figured, you might as well read it. And I'll, be, I'll shoot straight with you. You know what I thought I was going to read? I thought it was going to be like the Nicorette gum of pornography. You know, where, you know, if you're trying to quit smoking, you can just have nicotine in other ways and then wean yourself off of smoking. Well, I thought the message of the book is going to be just to slowly wean yourself from looking at things, thinking things you shouldn't as men. And that's not what happened. Men, it went hardcore with the highest standard possible, right at the, get, right at the get-go. Ephesians 5.3, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity, or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. And I'm not going to lie. The standard for how God is honored with our bodies when it comes to sex and sexuality is a high standard, not even a hint. So for you married men, especially I'm talking to you, that means you have one source of sexual fulfillment that God talks about, and that is your spouse, that is your wife. Anything else? It doesn't meet the standard. And if you're single or anybody, no matter what your status is, if you are lusting, it doesn't meet the standard. And if you're like me, and you've had any experience with any of this at all in your life, I remember especially when I was in the thick of that battle as a young believer, there were times I'm like, I can't do it. I'm just too weak. Well, I'm, I got good news for you. You admitting that might be the best thing you'll ever do. Because later on to these same believers in a second letter that Paul wrote to them, in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, he says, So to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Now, I won't go into the detail, but basically, Paul's pretty awesome. And God was giving him all these revelations, and they were really cool. And if you were getting that, you'd start to feel like you were a super Christian man, you know? And, and Paul recognized that, and he said, and, but I got this thorn in the flesh. And it doesn't say what it was. Some scholars think it might have been a physical ailment. Some have even speculated, could it have been a temptation that he struggled with in battle? We don't know what that thorn in the flesh was, but it was harassing to him. It was from the enemy. And, he, and it says in verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. But if you feel like, why would God let me go through this and struggle with this in any way? It's because of that right there. His grace is not made perfect in your ability to be strong. His grace is sufficient for you when you are weak. It's made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. O oh, friends, you're right. You can't do this, but he can do it in your life. And so some of you are like, oh, I don't really feel tempted in these areas very well. And I hope and pray that's true, but definitely ask God to reveal to you if there's something you need to do here, a tweak you need to make based on just allowing the Bible to be your sole source of authority when it comes to matters of sex and sexuality. I want to give you one more book recommendation. 
I would almost call this the textbook in this teaching. It's called Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, written by a man named Christopher Yuan, who his story is simply crazy. I mean, if you would have met this guy when he was a college student, you would never dream he would write this book. He was in the thick of the opposite of everything God teaches about sexuality. And yet God just transformed his life. And God's using him now to tell his story. And here's a guy that doesn't wake up every day and say, I am so strong. I'm really good at this. No, he wakes up every day and he says, God, help me. Battling same-sex attraction daily, but choosing a life of celibacy to honor God with his body. Because he believes what this book says. Everything that it says, he believes it. So once again, the health tweak is this. Decide once and for all that you will let the Bible be your sole authority on matters of sexuality. And we're just being really specific. Your sole authority on who he is and his plan for your life. That's what this book's all about. So what does that mean? In a moment, we're going to pray, then we're going to sing another song before we leave and dismiss. When I lead in prayer in a moment, it's not for me to talk and you to hear my prayer. This is for you to talk to God. And when I'm praying aloud, I wonder what might be your prayer. It might be just simply, God, help me. I need your help. I need your guidance to be stronger. I need your strength to make better choices. Honestly, I don't think there's any way that this can become real in our lives unless you've taken your first step of faith. We sing about surrendering, that that moment where you say, God, I believe, I do believe that you sent your son Jesus to die for me and to hang on that cross and step out of that grave so that if I believe in you, I will have eternal life. Do you really believe that? If you've never taken that step of faith, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Perhaps today is the day of your salvation to say, you know what? I'm tired trying to do life my way. It ain't working. That's a great place to be where you finally surrender to the one who made you and loves you because he has a plan for your life. You saw some amazing baptisms earlier. It's like slipping on the wedding ring to declare your faith to the world. Maybe you've been following Jesus for a while, but you've never been baptized. You're like, I want to do that. I want to do that too. Let us know that if you want. We'll tell you how you can tell us that in just a moment. But first, what would you pray to the Lord right now? Would it be... Help me, God. Maybe it's even just a simple prayer. God, I'm sorry. I failed in this area, and and I know it. I'm sorry. I don't know what your prayer is, but I invite you to speak honestly to yourself and to him as we take just a little bit of time to pray right now. Will you bow with me as we do that? God, I hear you saying loudly and clearly today, I love you, God. I love every one of you all in that room right now. I love every one of you watching and listening online. I made you. I put you together. You say in your word, God, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God, you're just loving us enough to tell us hard truths today. And I thank you for that, God. I just pray right now, thanking you for your amazing grace that frees us and causes us to experience all that you have in store for us, oh God. And Lord, there might be someone here in this room or watching and listening online that when it comes down to it, the most important thing they can do is say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, save me. Lord, I pray that they would call upon your name and know that by asking you to save them and forgive them, that they are now your child forever and ever. Father, we almost, I would almost venture to say all of us have failed in some way in this area of sex and sexuality. And we do ask that you forgive us, oh Lord. That God, you would give us the strength to embrace your teaching and to live it out. And God, I believe not just for us that in many ways you will use our lives to declare to the world that there's a better way to live, a more free way to live. But Father, I just pray right now that you would hear all the prayers being lifted up right now, that you would speak to all the hearts that are open to you right now, and that, Father, we would take whatever next step you want us to take.
by your strength and by your power. We pray this in Jesus' name.